And so today, we are going to be blessed, because I was blessed in the first service, and we are going to be blessed today by Pastor Carolyn. So let's put our hands together, and let's be blessed by Pastor Carolyn. And uh, she asked for it, she got it, Toyota, amen? So you are on the spot, and you're on live stream, and everybody across the U.S. Last, 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 last Sunday, last Sunday, we had over a thousand some people view our, view our, via our live stream, and so those who are watching on live stream today, God bless you. You get to meet our seniors pastor, Pastor Carolyn. So come on, don't be shy now. Come on, just because you're on camera, God bless you. He exaggerates a little bit, I'll say that. <laughs> so anyway, I'm just a little nervous because my family is here, and if they would like to stand up, all my family that's here. Thank you. Some of them had to go home already, so it's not the full 30 that we had last night. But anyway, I have a family that's a little on the weird side, and they'll all admit to that. And we come from various sources, but we're all family. So when I got married, I got married to a man who had two sons. So I was an instant stepmother. Ooh. <laughs> but they're like sons to me. I never call them my stepsons except on occasions like this. And then I had two of my own. My daughter arrived. And she was exactly as ordered. She came out to be a girl, because there were two boys. We wanted a girl. And she had red hair, so she was perfect in every way. And she still is today, even if she doesn't think I think that, but I do think that about her. And then I had a son. And so we had these two older boys, and we had two younger kids. And then I got this thing in my head when I got saved from James, that we're supposed to take care of widows and orphans in their time. And so I wanted to take care of an orphan. So we started adoption proceedings. And we were old and had four children, and therefore they said, babies are out for you. <laughs> so why don't you try for an older child? So we adopted a girl when she was 14 years old, and she fit right into the middle of our family. So we had a kind of a crazy family. And then we also had a foster child at that time which was sort of a disaster. Anyway, um, so I've been kind of every kind of mother in the world. And we have every kind of family. But we had such a good time last night together. And it was just so awesome to have unity in the family. So anyway, that I wanted to share a little bit about my family before I started preaching. So anyway. Father, we just thank you so much for bringing us together today. We thank you for your love for us, for your care for us, for your constant being with us. Father, I just pray that your word will be spoken with truth and with compassion and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk, I do have my Bible with me. I might be old, but I'm not technically stupid. <laughs> so, <We are. laughs> so I want you to know that I have my Bible with me. And I want to encourage you, if you have a smartphone and you don't have a Bible on your smartphone, U version is a really good version because it has numerous translations. It gives you a Bible verse every day. You can do devotions with it. And you can search out the scriptures that you can't remember where they are, but you want to find them. And so I encourage you. But the other thing is, I hardly ever forget to take my cell phone with me, right? You can't live without your cell phone these days. So I always have my Bible with me. And if I want to look something up, I can look it up because I have my Bible with me. <laughs> this is not totally secular. It has some scripture on it. So anyway, um, so I'd encourage you to use your cell phone for God as well as for your friends and Facebook and all the rest of the stuff that you use your cell phone for. Anyway, 
A few weeks ago, my niece came to visit me, Jill, her mother is here, my sister, and um, we went to the Barron County Farmer's Market, and she found this sign, and it said, Jesus knows me, this I love. So a little twist on the old song. And I thought first, oh, that's so cute. And then I thought, oh, Jesus loves me. But maybe not you, but he loves me. It's a little egotistical. And then my third thought was, it's true. Jesus knows me. And that's why I should love him. But he not only knows me, he loves me. And that's really the heart of the gospel. We like to major on the minors in scriptures a lot. I know everything that God wants me to do because I've read the Bible through every year for the last 40 years, and I know everything I'm supposed to do. But do I love my neighbor? Do I know all the theology, but I don't have the heart of the gospel, which is that Jesus loves me, and he actually loves you too. I will give that cons consolation prize to you that you get loved also. But anyway, when I was um, a born-again Christian, it was about 30 years, 40, 50, every year it gets longer away. <laughs> but it took me about 30 years to get the knowledge that God loved me from here to my heart, from my head to my heart. I knew God loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I got that. But I didn't get it here until we went to a ladies' retreat from this church. And one of the things we did was we broke up into little groups, and Jeannie Tuxell was my group, and we were supposed to tell each other what we thought God wanted us to tell the person. And so she told me she saw me like Esther going before King Ahasuerus in the book of Esther. And if she went before him without his asking for her, and he said, no dice, that was the end of her, that was execution time. But he didn't say that to her. He accepted her, and he wanted her to come in and tell him what she wanted. So... The one thing God used to do with me is when he wanted to teach me something, because I'm a little slow, he said, I want you to read this for 30 whole days. So he had me read five little verses in Esther where she went before the king every day for 30 days. And it took me about 29, I got it one day early this time, that I realized how much King Ahasuerus loved Esther to invite her to come into his presence. And all of a sudden I realized, if he loved her that much, how much does God love me? And all of a sudden that knowledge went from here to my heart. And it radically changed me. I spent the next half hour with my doggy taking a walk, telling God I was sorry it took me so long to figure that out. But it changed my life radically. Because once you realize how much God loves you, loving other people becomes simple not hard anymore. You quit looking at their faults and their failings and you start looking at them like Jesus does. And he doesn't look like us, like we look at people. And it's so interesting. Oh, you gotta silence this beast. Anyway. You know, they give you new updates all the time, and then you can't figure out how to use your phone, right? <laughs> that wasn't the same screen I saw the last time I did that. <laughs> anyway, um, so anyway, that's why I love that, so that, that sign so much, knowing that God knows me, and yet he loves me. How awesome is that? So we are going to turn and study a psalm of David because David was a man that was after God's own heart. And when he wrote this psalm, I know he was after God's own heart. So we're going to turn to Psalm 139. 
And this time I'm going to get it on my little thing here. We're going to read, oh, I think I'm going to get it on this little thing here. It's on the screen. Okay. Oh, Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. Just think about how well God knows us. Jesus said in Matthew that he knows how many hairs are on our head. Isn't that amazing? I don't know how many hairs are. Some of us have more hair than we used to have, less hair than we used to have, rather. But he knows everyone that's on our head. That's how well God knows us. He knows my every thought. Ooh, that's not a very good idea. God, there's some thoughts I don't want you to have that are in my head. But he knows them, and he loves me anyway. And he loves you anyway. He's not looking for perfection in us. He's looking for faithfulness in us. That we just return to him the love that he shares with us. Sounds simple, doesn't it? It's not always simple. It took me 30 years to get there, after all. He knows where I am at all times. And he knows every word I'm going to say. Oh. God, I wish you'd stop some of those ones before they get out of my mouth, right? <laughs> but he knows them all, and he loves me anyway. Isn't that an awesome thing? He surrounds me wherever I go. You know, there's this theological statement that says that God is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere all the time. Now, that's very hard for me to comprehend with my little brain that there is a being that can be everywhere because I'm only here. Well, now I'm there. But here and there is all I can be. I can't be both places at one time, but God is everywhere all the time. A being like that is pretty hard to comprehend, but it's true. And he says that. He surrounds me everywhere I go. Isn't that amazing? I can never get away from God. Doggone it, sometimes I wish I could because I really want to be lazy and do my own thing and I don't want to do what he wants me to do. But he's there all the time. And he still loves me. Isn't that amazing? Then let's go on and we'll go on to verses 7. I can never escape from your spirit. Oh, my gosh. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as day, and the darkness and light are the same to you. He never leaves me nor forsakes me. There's no place I can go that God isn't. He chases after me, like that song, Reckless Love. When I first, you know, sometimes you read these songs and you think, what on earth are they talking about? But that's what this is talking about. He chases after me because he's always around me, and he never leaves me or forsakes me. So that's true. And I love that part of God. That's why when I know these things, I love him so much more so it's so wonderful to know all the things you can find out about God. His purpose is to guide and strengthen me. We never have to lack knowledge because all we have to do is ask God. 
You know, one of the things that's the craziest thing about us Christians is we have a God who created the universe, who holds it in the palm of his hand. He's that big. And when you find out that nobody knows how big the universe is, there's only one person that does, and that's God. The scientists keep trying to find out, but they find out that there's more, 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 more all the time. The more the telescope can tell them, the farther out in space they can go, they just keep saying, there is no end to this place because there's no end to God. And so that God, that very God, wants to guide and strengthen me. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? So then let's go on to the next phase here, because this is really a neat part. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. He knew you before you were born. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. Do you know how well your work, his workmanship is in you? Or do you think your body is too fat and sloppy and you're there thinking straight and blah, blah, blah? How many things can we think that are wrong with us when God wants us to know the one thing that's right with us if we ask Jesus into our life is we've done the one thing he's asked us to do in our life that makes him exceedingly happy. And that's we invite Jesus to be in us. And then when we invite Jesus to be in us, then not only does God surround us, but he's in us too. Isn't that exciting? I mean, really, if you weren't very worthwhile, do you think God would want to be in you? I don't think so, because he thinks we're worthwhile even if we don't think we're very worthwhile. And so he wants us to change our thoughts because he has thoughts of us that are wonderful. So anyway... He saw, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. He's known before you did that naughty thing that you did that naughty thing, and he knew all along you were going to do it, and he didn't stop you from doing it. But sometimes you paid the consequences for doing it, right? <laughs> and you wish you hadn't done it. But he knew all along because he knew every day of your life before it even happened. Now, did he force you to do those things? No. He just knew you were going to do them. He gave you the choice, but he knew what choice you were going to make. That's so amazing. And he still chooses to live in me. Holy cow, what a God. Really truthfully, how awesome is that? that he loves you so much that you can do naughty, bad things and he still loves you. Anybody who has kids, though, you know you still love your kids even though they do naughty, bad things. Well, God's no different. And sometimes we think that God doesn't like us. He doesn't care. He's mad at us because we did something bad. But that's not true. He loves us. He knows us, and he knew before we did all these things that we were going to do them. How awesome is that? Right. To have a God that loves you so much that he's willing to let you do things that he doesn't want you to do. And he still loves you anyway. How precious are your thoughts about me, God? Think about that. His thoughts about us are precious. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? That's awesome. They can't be numbered. He, we can't even number the thoughts that God has about us. Holy cow. How awesome is that? I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you're still with me? He didn't go to sleep and leave us alone. He stayed with us all through the night. Isn't that exciting? I just had an event, and I'm going to share that my sister went through on her way to visit me. She lives in Durango, Colorado, which is about 5,000 miles from any good airport. And so 
you have to, if you're going to fly out of Durango, you're taking your chances. And she took her chances and yeah. failed the first day. So she was supposed to arrive on Friday. And she didn't arrive on Friday because the plane didn't take off from Durango. So then on Saturday, the plane took off, or sort of took off. It took a while for it to get off the tarmac and into the air because they had a little something wrong with the plane. And they <laughs> Anyway, well, it, it was a disaster. But then when she got to Denver, where she's supposed to transfer to the plane here, they didn't have a gate for her. So they sat on the tarmac another 45 minutes waiting for a gate. And by then, her other plane had gone bye-bye. So she missed her connection. So then, of course, they have to find a connection. You know, that's not easy these days because the planes are so full. So eventually, eventually, she landed in Minneapolis. And I told her, too bad, so sad, all the people we had arranged to pick her up and bring her home, she was going to have to drive herself. And I told her how to get out of the airport by telling, asking somebody how to do that because Minneapolis Airport is a little tricky getting out and getting on the road you want to get out on. So anyway, so she's standing in line waiting to get a car and there's this guy behind her and I guess they got started talking and all of a sudden he volunteered to take her to my house. How about God arranging something like that? Isn't that awesome? But he knew all along all that stuff was going to happen. And this nice guy, she, of course, took a little chance taking it with a guy she didn't know. But <laughs> this nice guy, and he was a nice guy, brought her to my house. And the amazing thing is he was going to Iron River, so it really wasn't totally out of his way to come my way instead of going a little farther north and across. So wasn't that exciting? He knew that. He got it all arranged. He takes care of us. And a lot of times we're in places that look awful, terrible, and they're painful as all get out. But he never leaves us or forsakes us. And he goes through those. Can he prevent them? I suppose he could, but why doesn't he? Because life is like that. There are bad things that happen to very good, innocent people just because we live in a world where evil exists. And it's not necessarily our fault, but we're stuck with it. But he's there with us. If we let him take us through, he will take us through. If we get angry, mistake, and, and, and ignore him, he'll let us do that too because he loves us and cares for us. Then the next section goes on. <clears throat> Oopsie, we skipped part of it. Sorry, back to the other one. Um, he watches over me in the womb. Where's that part on there? OK, well, we'll talk about it anyway. He watches over me in the womb, <clears throat> verse 15. He saw me every day and knew every day of my life, and his thoughts are precious over there. Then he goes on to the next section, and it says, and it says in the next section that, starting in verse 19, if you would only destroy the wicked, and I came to this part of the, this thing, and I think, what on earth is he bringing this up for and all this good stuff? And the thing is, if we really love Jesus, we love the things he loves, and we hate the things he hates. And our enemies, Jesus tells us, are not flesh and blood, but are principalities and powers, the evil one. And so when he says that we, he wishes that we would destroy the wicked, he would destroy the wicked, we're talking about Satan. And God does hate his, he wants us to hate the enemies that are his enemies because he hates them also. But then my response to God's overwhelming love is the last two verses here. Let 
Look through me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any sinful way in me and lead me in the way that lasts forever or lead me in the way of righteousness. That's our response to God and his love for us. <clears throat> to search me and test me, to point out my sins so I can get rid of them. The Bible says the love of Christ constrains me or wants, helps me to do the right thing. I want to become like Jesus because I love him and I want to be his imitator. I don't want to become like Jesus so I get brownie points, that I get gold stars on my chart of the week. And I have three gold stars on Monday and two on Tuesday, and Wednesday was a really bad day, so I got none. And Thursday, I made up for it and got five. And that's not what God's looking for. He's looking for us to love him so much we want to do what's right. And that's so, so important. Because if I'm doing it so that I feel better about myself, I'm doing it for me, I'm not doing it for Jesus. But if I do it because I love him, that's why when somebody needs their trees cut down in their yard because this big wind came through and destroyed them all, and you're sitting and saying, oh, my lovely trees are all down there, and then you have to get rid of them. We go and help because we love Jesus. That's why we go and help. It's not because I'm going to get a brownie point and sue and <clears throat> Sue's going to just love me because I came out and cut down her trees. No, I do it because I love Jesus, and therefore I love my friends, that, right. church friends, right. and I want to help them. In the end, I can't escape God. Neither can you. He's everywhere. I think the worst thing about hell is that you'll see Jesus there and know that you've missed it. To me, that's worse than any fire that could ever burn me is to think I miss Jesus. His knowing is eternal as is his love. He never leaves me nor forsakes me. He's with me all the time. He surrounds me. He's in me. How can I escape him? Why would I want to? And God isn't some egomaniacal control freak person in the sky. He's the ever-present, ever-knowing, ever-loving guy. That's my rhyme. Sky and God did pretty well tonight, Pastor. So why would I want to escape him or not know him? How crazy would that be? So my encouragement for you today is to be not crazy, but choose Jesus in your life and follow after him because he'll bring you love. And what more could we ask for in life? And I encourage you not only to receive his love, but to give it away. We need to love each other with the same love that Jesus loves us because that's what he told us to do. His last sermon to his best buddies is in John chapter 13 through John chapter 17. And he says in there, I want you to love each other as I love you. Tall order. But I need to know how much he loves me so that I can love you with the same love. And what kind of a church would we be if we all loved each other with the love of Jesus? Wouldn't that be awesome? So I encourage you, read this psalm. Believe it. Believe he knows you and loves you and cares for you and wants you to love him back. That's all he's asking. Not much, but it's a big barrier sometimes. Because loving him means I have to be loving. So I encourage you to do that. Father, we just praise you and bless you.
We thank you for your great love. We thank you that you know us better than we know ourselves and that you love us anyway. And I just thank you so much for your presence with us here today. Go with us this week and keep us safe in your loving arms. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give it up for Pastor Carolyn. Amen. 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 I love this lady. I love this lady. You know, um, I, I just want to leave you with this thought. There are two wills that God gives you. All right? Now get this. There's two wills that God gives you. He gives you his permissive will or his perfect will. I want you to hear this. His permissive will is that he doesn't agree with you, but he'll let you do it. How many of you as parents have said that about your kids? I don't agree with you, but I'm going to let you do it. God gives you his permissive will, and he still loves you even though you do it and you find yourself in a mess. How many of you know what I'm talking about, right? That's called the permissive will. But God's perfect will, he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is fixed on him. His perfect will is doing exactly what he tells you to do. And that prevents you from the accidents, the things that happen in your life. So there's the permissive will. So whenever you're making the decision, let me just help you with something. Whenever you're making the decision, here's what you're at. You're at a crossroads or a fork in your life. you got to ask yourself, is this God's permissive will or is this God's perfect will? And I don't know about you, but as a believer in Christ, I want to walk in his perfect will because that's where peace, that passive all understanding comes from. His permissive will, uh, will allows me to go through the peaks and the valleys and the hard times and the discouraging times of my life only because you, you asked for it, you chose it. So, uh, okay, I'll let you do it. How many remember that? You know what I'm talking about? So whenever you're making decisions in your life, Monday through Friday, Saturday, and you come back on Sunday to get bandaged up, ask yourself, why are you wounded? Did you go in God's permissive will? Or are you God's perfect will? Will you stand with us today? I'm so proud of her. And thank you, family members, for being here today. Thank you for being here. Let me pray a blessing over you today. Father, I thank you for this wonderful congregation, and I mean that with all my heart. I thank you, Father, that you, Lord God, have blessed this congregation. Bless them in their going in and in their going out. I pray that, God, that you will fill their vats to full and running over. Father, that you say in your word, give and it shall be given unto them, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And it doesn't mean material things, Father. It's given of our time, our service, our energy. Lord, and I pray that, God, you will fill the vats of those here today for all the sacrifices and things that these people have been doing for certain ones here in this church. Bless them for all what they are doing. Now go with us, Father. Recharge our energy and our batteries, Lord, and prepare us for a new week that's ahead of us. Go with us now, we pray, and bring us back tonight for Miracle Sunday, and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you today. Have a great day in Jesus. God bless you.